didn't uh, have time to find an appropriate response of some for our service this morning, I thought what we would do is read our second scripture lesson together. It's very short, only six verses. It comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And I think just saying the words out loud, I don't know, that's the in our hearts anymore. So if you would read with me now. And of course, I is Paul writing to the church. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. And again, just being away emphasizes that. Um, on the second Sunday, I was in England. You know, another time, maybe I'll show you some pictures of it. I worshipped at St. Stephen's Road, St. Stephen's Road Baptist Church in Cambridge over 300 years old. And I only found him that morning. It was like a gift to me that one of the pastors there, Reverend Robinson, had written my favorite hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. So we prayed for the world there too, and uh, just made, made it so real that we are part, this little, church here in rural Nova Scotia is part of this worldwide fellowship of faith and uh, it's good to be reminded of that. So as we come to reflect on our scriptures this morning, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together will be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now, um, it's always a danger to uh, start or to, to reference a movie because not everybody watches movies or watches the same movies. But I'm going to start. Do you know the movie Groundhog Day? How many have seen Groundhog Day? <coughs> Most of you. It was released in 1993, but it, was, it has been considered by some you know, movie critics one of the best movies of, of the 90s. And we run so common, you, there are often, you, you see it around. It tells the story of a cynical and grumpy weatherman, Phil Connors, who travels to Puxatawney, Pennsylvania, to cover the annual Groundhog Day festivities. And you know, you may, you know, on February 2nd, when they report on the news from around, and they often uh, reference punks, da, uh, punks, uh, 20, I have to look at this. Totally, yeah, it's hard. Sam, and so he's a very famous friend of <clears throat> Anyway, as Phil Connors gets caught in a storm and he's forced to stay in town overnight, and then he's caught in a time loop which forces him to re relive the day, February 2nd, over and over and over again. So at first, he uses his knowledge of the day's events to manipulate people and events to his own advantage and entertainment with some hilarious and some pretty wild events. But gradually, he begins to change himself and in doing that, changes others around him for the good. He saves people from deadly accidents, 
He learns to play the piano, to sculpt in ice, to speak French, to the point that the townspeople really come to admire him. He falls in love, naturally, he falls in love with a local girl and is finally able to move ahead and into a new day. February 3rd finally arrives. And he is a transformed person, less cynical, with less resentment, and more open to other people. Something of this Phil Collins seems to be reflected in the people we encounter in our Old Testament lesson. Their flight from Egypt had not lived up to their expectations, and they were starving in the wilderness. Where was the land that was flowing with milk and honey that like they had been promised? Even when God provides them with manna and quails, they don't seem especially grateful. Farther on in the book of Exodus, we find out in the story, they begin to grumble about this boring diet. First, they complain they didn't have meat and bread. When God provides it, they feel that it's to the same. It seems so familiar and so human, doesn't it? No matter what advantages we're given, there's always a fly in the ointment. I can see it in my own life. You know, just returning from this wonderful trip two weeks in England, maybe my first big trip in over a decade. Truly a wonderful experience. Many would envy it, envy me. And trust me, it was a memorable trip. But of course, there were inconveniences, annoying delays, impatient service people, disappointments. How easy to complain or grumble. I wish we would have, if only we had known, why didn't we? Well, let me close on one. Resentment and grumpiness are tricky subjects. And thank you to Amy for coming up with another really lovely picture. We tend to bristle a bit if we're accused of being resentful or grumpy and usually resort to self-justification. However, to be totally honest, we'll admit we can be resentful or grumpy about all sorts of things. Children will complain bitterly if one child gets, seems to, even seems to receive one little bit more of a treat than another. Now, adults aren't above such similar behavior either. A colleague has given more perks than oneself job doesn't give us the personal satisfaction we expected. We're not equally acknowledged for our volunteer work, maybe especially in the church. It seems we can't stop ourselves from complaining, our, comparing our lot with others, but being slightly put out if we're given less than someone else, or even worse, if we're somehow overlooked. Well, I think such feelings are part of our human nature, and it's tempting to separate them from our spiritual nature. But as I think you've probably heard me say before, I feel so strongly about this, the human being is an integrated whole. Our physical selves, our emotional beings, and our spirits are all intricately connected, and they affect each other. That's why psychologists advise us not to make important decisions if we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Four of the most common stressors making up the word halt. Two physical states, hungry and tired, and two emotional states, angry and lonely. While all of those states are normal, part of the human condition, it's how we handle them that determines how healthy we are and may in turn affect our spiritual health as well. If we apply our understanding of feelings to resentment, we discover that when we act out of an accumulated pool of resentments within us, when they build up, we tend to be hard on others, making their lives difficult as well as our own. You know, the effects of resentment can be a heavy burden to bear. 
and a burden that weighs heavily both on ourselves and others. The ancient monk, St. Benedict, who founded the Order of Benedictines, and who was responsible for coming up with what he called a rule of life, which a lot of spiritual directors still follow. He was very clear that what is not possible to us by nature is possible to God through grace. So, we pray. But paradoxically, prayer can sometimes become a way of actually feeding our resentments and grumpiness by making us concentrate on those things that we think need to be addressed. So I'm going to suggest that perhaps a more effective approach would be to find something every day for which we can be genuinely thankful, that we can give thanks or praise for. Now, in this business of giving thanks or praise, I don't know about you, but I find for myself, if I'm feeling exhausted, overworked, annoyed with something, or just grumpy about the way life is going to be in general, the best I can manage is just to thank God for all that it is. It's easier for me than to think, try to think of specific things to thank God for that might be considered a little bit more spiritual um, in a way. You know, like thanking God for the beauties of nature when I'm, you know, facing a mountain of work. Or other things that might not be, I might not be likely thinking of at the moment. But somehow the act of thanking God, just turning my gaze away from myself, is the best way of lifting the burden of grumpiness from my shoulders and then hopefully from the shoulders of others. The added benefit is that it makes me feel better as a result. Another important element in dealing with, in, with resentment in those situations where reconciliation is needed is to do just that. I just recently heard a story about a Hollywood star in the 30s who was having her picture taken by a well-known photographer. She fussed continually, turning this way and that, wanting her best side facing the camera and everything to be just right. After a considerable lot of bother to get into just the right position, she said to the photographer, Now, do me justice. The poor photographer was reported to have replied to her, Madam, pardon me for saying so, but you don't need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> Perhaps that might be a good reminder, if any of us, to, to, any, to all of us, that if we truly got what we deserved, we'd all be in a lot of bother. We all need mercy. <clears throat> And that is why reconciliation is at the heart of our gospel. If people know nothing of God's love and grace, then they have only their own anger and resentment to rely on when things, bad things happen. And with no regrets to go, it's all too easy to become bitter, as Bill Collins did in the movie Groundhog. What this means is that there is a responsibility to us to live out the gospel in a different way. We need to be prepared to be bold in witnessing to the transforming power of God's love and grace. As St. Paul said in our epistle reading this morning, we need to get on with the difficult business of forgiving the people it's hardest for us to forgive. As our translation read, bury with one another in love. We need to draw a deep spiritual breath and find the way forward that blends justice and mercy and will leave our hearts calm and our relationships renewed. And the good news is that we don't need to struggle with this all on our own. 
point of our Old Testament passage is to assure us of God's presence of the deepest and the most meaningful kind, which we experience, especially when we gather together, as we do each week here together. The presence of God was shown to the people of Israel in the wilderness, feeding them with manna and water, and leading them into the promised land. The promise of Christ is promised to us too. When he instituted the Holy Communion during the Last Supper with his disciples, and when he promised that when two or three are gathered together, he is present there too. With that promise, we have the courage and will to advance God's kingdom through our love to others to whom we bear witness to the risen life of Christ. And it doesn't take much. A little care, a kind word, a smile. Although they may seem like tiny gestures, they can be a touch of God, offered in the Spirit of God. Transforming people, whether, whether we ourselves are grumpy or whether they are. So we can all be transformed into the people who God has called us to be, and to help others to be the same as well, through our prayer, our commitment to reconciliation, and through our practice of simple goodness. God's grace through Jesus Christ can transform our grumpiness into reconciliation, and indeed, therefore, transform us as well. Amen.